liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing okay. Yeah. So you're still not taking any medicine? No, no, no. We, you're still we, coughing. Still coughing. Still not taking any medicine. This is just the way I live my life now. I, I maintain <laughs> that it's TB. You think so? Yeah. I don't know. You've been coughing for like three years, so. I have been coughing for a long time. Yeah. This feels like it's different, but who knows? Maybe it's just escalated to this point. Yeah, it does sound different. <laughs> does it? Yeah. yeah, you get yeah. that little squeak at the end. Yeah. <laughs> it just won't go away, man. I don't know. No, I know. Mine, well, I think I talked about this last week. Mine actually went away for a couple of days, and then I got a different kind of sick. <laughs> yeah, well, see? Um, <laughs> Did I give you TB? Yeah, it might be. It might be it. <laughs> Dying of consumption now. Oh. Um I, Super my, spreader, man. My cough is essentially gone, though, again. Well, good. But uh, I'm still all stuffy. Uh, I, I have been thinking, though, because uh, like, I haven't done my allergy shots in, in like two months. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I didn't realize you would quit taking those. Well, I have quit taking them because they don't want you to take them if you are or have been recently sick. Ah. So, so you've been <laughs> recently sick for a while now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I had two weeks roughly that I couldn't do it because because uh, I actually had COVID. Yeah. Um, and then I was still coughing for so long after that that I didn't want to add to it. So I, I'm actually I'm I'm starting to think that maybe like some of it's just maybe those shots are doing me more good than I thought. That's what I'm starting <laughs> to think. Well, hopefully. That that was the idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> when you yeah. started taking them. <laughs> yeah. The point was that I would have less severe allergy issues. Um, I continued to have allergy issues, so I just assumed that the shots weren't really doing their job, but... Maybe not. Yeah. This Maybe. could be it. Well, this could be go. proof. Proof <laughs> of concept. Yep. Um, oh, well. So, <coughs> where do you want to begin? I don't know. Where do you want to start? Well, hmm. Good question. Um, let's start with the Abe thing. Okay. So, uh, the former Japanese prime minister, Shinzo Abe, uh, was assassinated, I guess, last week. Yeah, that was last it week. It was right? last week. Yeah. 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 Late last week. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, so, I mean, this is, it, it's, the whole situation is kind of bizarre. Like, this guy... Um, walked past his security and shot him, shot at him twice with a homemade shotgun, essentially. Yeah. Um, so they don't, guns are banned there, right? They don't have, do they not have guns in Japan? Like, I'm not, like, they certainly have very strict gun control. I'm sure that there are some. I mean, he ways wouldn't have that you made can, a gun if he could have just. Oh, went no, and no. He, one. Like, uh, yeah, he didn't have a license or anything. That's okay. for sure. Yeah. Um, I imagine there is some kind of licensing system, but I bet it's like severely restricted yeah. to like security and things like that. Probably. Okay. But I, I don't know for sure. I didn't actually look up gun laws in Japan. Uh, I was just curious. I uh, um, thought about it. It is not commonplace. Yeah. Um, they prefer swords. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and this would have been a much cooler story if he had used one. Uh, yeah, it probably would. <laughs> um, but uh, it was seized on in the U.S. Um, pretty quickly as a case for gun control. And I guess I don't understand why. Because yeah, it seems like this what is a clear... law <laughs> did they think they could make that could have stopped something like this? Yeah. Um, now, of course... Biden says, uh, well, you know, this is their first um, firearm murder this year, and we've had 300 or something like that. Um, and that's supposed to be telling in some way of how gun control works in Japan, I suppose. But mm, this is not comparing apples to apples. Like, you have to... It seems to me that culture must be taken into account. Yeah. And th that is a very different culture. Oh, without question. Um, yeah. That that weighs things in different ways. And uh, have you ever seen? Oh, actually, I know you saw a little bit of it because you you watched some of it with me. Uh, the uh, anime Sword Art Online. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so at the beginning of the second season of that, um, there's a story about uh, this girl who is in a virtual reality um, RPG. And she's there. It's like, uh, you know, gunfights and stuff. Yeah. Um, and she's there because she's trying to get over, or at least <coughs> partly, 
she's there because she's trying to get over a trauma um, of she was in a, a postal office when she was younger. Like I, I think she was supposed to have been like 11 or something like that. Um, and when this guy came in to rob the, the postal office and he had a gun and he was threatening people with a gun and um, he lost control of the gun and it hit the floor and she picked it up and he attacked her and she shot him. Oh, wow. And, yeah. and killed him. Yeah. And, um, it's a lot for an 11 year old. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> obviously this is a big trauma, but, yeah. um, what they depict in the show is that she is branded as a murderer yeah. by like classmates and so forth. Like there's this big stigma around her because she killed this guy. Yeah. Whereas in the United States, she would have been celebrated as a as hero. As a hero, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, in that situation, so that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and I that even I, in in a scenario where you're being threatened like that and use self defense, that mm-hmm. you, they would you your peers would still look down upon you. Yeah, and that's interesting. Yeah. So different culture. Yeah. Like, and I I can't I, I'm sure that the fact that guns are much harder to get a hold of. Um, no. you know, has an impact, but, uh, the murder rates in Japan are far lower than they are in the U S anyway. Yeah. Um, and you have real strict gun control in England and their murder rates are essentially the same as ours. Yeah. Yeah. It's, like, but uh, this seems to be representative of a cultural difference, not a difference in, in yeah. law. And, and as, as different as that culture is like, just from the story you just told, like mm-hmm. it, it seems so much different and foreign to me. I don't necessarily hate it. Like, I mean, because I guess the defense, the the other side would be as far as with the little girl is mm-hmm. she should have just held him and not killed him. Like that would be what you would, I mean, that would, I mean, is, that's the flip side to that, right? I mean, I can't imagine what the flip side would be. Like she got a hold of the gun. He's trying to take it from her. Yeah. You, you kill the guy, but <laughs> I mean, still the, the like to what, have, what to she's be a, that a 11 year old on a, you know, well, yeah. facing no, an adult I, male. I, while I agree, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just saying it, it's, it's interesting to me that the culture would be that much different and look, mm-hmm. take death that ser- to that extreme yeah you know to, to to clearly somebody was in a life or death situation mm-hmm. and defended their self and to still not to embrace it in that way is just odd yeah um but it's like i say it, it's not like i say i don't i don't necessarily agree with it but i don't hate it either yeah well i mean there there is something to be said and and this is actually one of the topics that they explore in that particular show yeah um or that that character arc yeah. um, is like coming to terms with the evil that you've done for the good of others. Yeah. Like, Oh yeah. You Absolutely. know, like how many people were saved by her doing that? You know, this is, yeah. you know, this is one <laughs> of the, one of the questions that they deal with within the show. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I, I and kind of what they settle on is that it's important to recognize the terrible things that you've done yeah. Um, and recognize them as terrible things, but then to also accept them in light of how many others it it helped, yeah. and yeah. It, you know that you're that you didn't have a lot of choices in that situation, and the choice was to, um, in her case, the choice was to to die or to you know try and save herself and others. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and anyway, uh, not to, it's just <laughs> fascinating, but the, but the, the, yeah, but the other cultures deal is pretty interesting. Like mm-hmm. there's, there's, and there's definitely something to that as far as when you're looking at these type of statistics, you've got to, I mean, you just can't take, oh, they don't have guns there. This is the difference. Yeah. And when it's, it's really not. Yeah. And I, as I understand it, um, the part of it may also be that the Japanese, um, judicial system is brutal. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if they have an assumption <laughs> of innocence like we do here or anything like that, but I know their conviction rate is sky high it's compared to the Western world. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when, uh, you when know. you, when you use self-defense, like it's got to seriously, yeah, and, like beyond any doubt. And if you commit a crime, you can feel pretty confident that you will end up That you will punished. be convicted. Yeah. yeah. Unlike here, you know, you get you a good lawyer, you get off with anything. Yeah. Um, you serve only part of your sentence. You like, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. You negotiate it down, but not mm. over there. Like, it's, Yeah, it doesn't seem to be. Yeah. 
Um, like, I'm not real familiar again with the Japanese legal system, but yeah, but, uh, but, but I've that, seen the conviction rates. To, and, that seems to jive, though. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, I can definitely see that. Yeah. Um. So I, I think that this is, you know, first off, it doesn't the the fact that they have so low of a um a gun crime rate compared to us. They also have an incredibly low violent crime rate compared to us. Yeah. Um, and uh, other countries that are more similar to us, like England, yeah, that have really strict gun laws as well, um, may have lower uh, gun crime rates because they're less available, but their violent crime rates are yeah. essentially the same. Yeah. Um, so I would say, like, my point here, I guess, is just that it's representative of some other difference, not a difference in gun laws. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing is, and I think this is probably the more important point, is um, <laughs> beyond like, uh, well, as a starting point, like what gun law would you propose to stop that? Like what happened there? Yeah, there's not much you can do. I mean, I the mean, guy somebody went, that sets their mind to do, and mm-hmm. that's really, like you say, that's really the point. Somebody that sets their mind to do something is going to find a way to do it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the guy essentially put a firearm together with bamboo duct tape and batteries. Yeah. I like, mean, it's, yeah. it's a little more complicated than that, but the guy but was intent, obviously, yeah. Yeah. On, yeah. on committing this kind of crime and set about to do it and, like, got his materials from the Japanese version of Home Depot. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You, you can't... <clears throat> there's nothing you can ever do to prevent somebody from doing... That, that set their mind to do something like that from doing it. And yeah. just as an odd side note, um, the background to this is supposedly religious. Yeah. I, so <laughs> we were talking about the other night and I had done, yeah, I don't know specifically, but it, it apparently there is, yeah, some kind of religious aspect to it. Yeah. Like, um, Abe was involved with some, um, some religious group that the guy's mother supposedly had like given her life savings to or something. Yeah. Um, I forget. I, can't, I wish I could remember it, but I, I, can't, I can't remember I can't pull either, it either. But I, I, but I, I, <laughs> I just, I thought that was just an interesting, I, I'm not sure that that's true. It seems yeah. a little far fetched. Um, I mean, I've heard from but, other sources that Abe was in fact, or well, Abe's father, I guess was in fact involved in this religious group. Yeah. Um, but who knows? That well, seems... crazy people are going to come up with crazy ideas. Like, yeah. And anybody that's crazy enough to assassinate a former prime minister is going to mm-hmm. be crazy enough. I to... thought he was incredibly resourceful. I was kind yeah. of impressed in some ways. Um, but the I, I th- to try and get around to the what I think <laughs> is the important point um, is that uh, that there's not a gun law that could have stopped this. And that being the case, wouldn't you like to be able to defend yourself from the crazy man with the bamboo shotgun with a firearm? Yeah. Like, what would you like to be able to have available to you to defend yourself against somebody like this? And because that's really what the question of firearms ownership is. That's that's what the the right to bear arms is about. It's about self-defense. Yeah. Um, and so the question is when the, you know, when the crazy man comes for you, what do you want to have in your pocket? Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's all I really have to say about that. Yeah. Uh, that was like, like a it's long just, way it, to get yeah, to that but point, it, I guess. It, it but. does kind of bother me that the gun control people have grabbed the, of this, of, of all things, this one, because this mm-hmm. seems like it's just such a clear cut. Like this is the reason we need to have these freedoms, not having them restricted. Yeah, it, it's a case against gun control, not for gun control. Yeah, exactly. Um, which, yeah, I agree. It, it makes it an odd case to grab onto, but it's just you know, it's another way of sensationalizing some kind of terrible event. Yeah. Um, and uh, and speaking of, uh, this is just like a little short story, but I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, you remember? I think it was less than a year ago. No. No, I'm I, I, now that I'm thinking about it, it almost had to have been while Trump was still in office. But I, I don't recall exactly when this happened. But the, the border patrol agents and the uh, whipping incident, where they were uh, whipping the Haitian immigrants, yeah, as they I remember when that went on. I can't remember, yeah. but I remember that it was a big deal. Yeah. yeah, and we talked about it at the time and said that it was like severely overblown, and like the claims that were being made didn't seem to be true. Yeah. Um. Well, the they have concluded their investigation. 
on this. And of course, always take it with a grain of salt because it's the government investigating itself. But um, they they were cleared of all criminal charges. Yeah. Um, the these border patrol agents, some of whom have been on administrative duties only for this, this entire time. time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so they were uh, all criminal charges were dropped. They uh, they don't even carry whips. Um, you know, there's just like a yeah. whole bunch of stuff <laughs> around it. It's like obvious that um, that what was claimed that they did wasn't done. Just didn't happen yet. Now, so were they exonerated? Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, really? No, they were not exonerated. Um, so they couldn't uh, convict them of any criminal charges, so they brought up administrative charges instead. Um, <laughs> and so the, these are, the administrative charges are things like... Uh, unprofessional conduct and um dangerous behavior and and so <laughs> forth and like some of the stuff just seems <coughs> really absurd to me like the the you know some of the incidents cited for the unprofessional conduct is that the you know the border patrol agents were telling these Haitian immigrants go back to Haiti now of course <laughs> what we did with the Haitian immigrants what the US government did to these Haitian immigrants mostly yeah. is send them back to Haiti <laughs> So, so, so maybe maybe they weren't telling them to go back. Maybe they were telling them we're going to take you back. Yeah, maybe it, be, it was just I mean, misunderstood. <laughs> this is this is border patrol too. Like this is literally their job. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, I thought that that one was odd because it seems to me that what they're saying is that it's okay to do it. You just can't say <laughs> you it. Can't say it. You're right. <laughs> right. Um, and then uh, like the dangerous behavior thing. Like one of the incidents cited was uh, you know. Um, let's see i don't remember it's like acting in a using your horse in a dangerous way around a minor or something like that and the <laughs> yeah. and the specific incident is that the um border patrol agent maneuvered the horse in such a way that it bumped this little girl and she like fell back into the river and that's dangerous behavior on the part of the border patrol agent but then i thought well what about her dad who pushed her in the river on the other side yeah right in the first place are we putting in charges against them <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah i mean Talking about acting dangerously with a minor, you know. No. Anyway, um, so, but I, I think the moral of that story is that even if you work for the government. You're not safe. Yeah. If you're low on the totem pole, at least. Yeah. Um, that uh, even if they can't get you with one type of charge, they'll just bring some other type of charge. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like, they're going to ruin these guys' lives one way or another. Yeah. Yeah, for doing nothing but their job. Yeah, like I mean, you can like it or not, but that is what they're being paid to do. Yeah, you know, I mean, they're they're border patrol agents. They patrol the border. Their job is to find people crossing it illegally and and bring them in. Yeah, like I mean, that's that is the job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no sense in having a border patrol if their job isn't to patrol the border and to yeah stop exactly. illegal crossing that's that's yeah that that is the job <laughs> yeah so um and i don't approve of it particularly i mean like yeah. i'm i'm an open borders guy now i would i would um, kind of like to know who's coming in and out <coughs> um but you know i i'm i'm against uh the immigration system as it is because it's another centrally planned system yeah. and truth is that absent the welfare state at least yeah in in a free market system um, everybody that crosses the border is an economic benefit to the rest of us. Yeah. Well, in, in a truly free market, if we lived in a truly libertarian society, that would mm -hmm. be the case. Yeah. Problem is, is that's just not the no, world we it, live it's in. It's not. So you're right. Um, you know, just as what it is. But yeah, it's, I mean, well, I, would, I would we, like we, to, we can have the immigration debate yeah. some other time to me. Um, like the, the government is screwing this up. Uh, by their other programs, so we have to give government control over this is uh, kind of like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Like you've yeah. got a problem of government and you're answering it by giving government more power over another aspect of that that is not even directly related. Yeah. Um, so uh, besides, who's to say that um, allowing uh, open immigration wouldn't um, bring a quicker end to the welfare state as people... You just want it to collapse. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. I mean, that maybe uh, American citizens... Yeah. Would would be more against it? Well, yeah. Yeah, if, if that was the way it worked. But it's just not. like Because the people who are for 
the system as it is mm -hmm. are for it because they want to help people. Well, because they're not really seeing, I, I don't think yeah. that they're really seeing the, the potential costs of it. And yeah. if we had an open border system and we were paying for everything, they would. Maybe. That might change their mind. I yeah. mean, it's like when, you, uh, when you're when you young and you're in college and you're working that minimum wage job and you think um, that, uh, you know, that that welfare is an important thing, that the government should be helping people out, blah, blah, blah. And then when you've, uh, you know, when you've finished school or gotten a real career and you're making some real money, then suddenly you're like, wait a minute, yeah. why the hell is the government taking so much of my money to give to other people? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, I don't know. Maybe. There's no way to know either way until we give it a shot. Until we That's do it, yeah. <laughs> um, so then, uh, the... All right. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is um, the uh, so Harper's magazine um, recently ran a cover uh, that said the American century is over. What's next? Yeah, I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, yeah, I was going to say when you when you read me that I was like, yeah, I got some things to say about that. Yeah, can definitely. <laughs> so I was thinking about I saw a uh, or not saw I listened to an interview on the Tom Woods show um, with Jason Rink, who's a, a documentary filmmaker. Um, this is some I don't know maybe a month ago. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I think it was mid June that he was he was on there. Anyway, um, this guy is doing a documentary on January 6th, on the whole January 6th event. Now, what had happened was um, he was doing a documentary on the Stop the Steal movement, and so he just happened to be there <laughs> or when, it, or when, when it all happened. this stuff happened. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, about and finding he had yourself been, in a place. Uh, he had been talking to um, leaders of the Stop the Steal movement, some of whom were implicated in the January 6th stuff, yeah. And so he just kind of shifted focus. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, during the course of the interview, um, Tom Woods was, and they were talking about how, like, you know, Jason Rink was saying, like, th this whole thing has been essentially fabricated. Yeah. Um, that there obviously wasn't any kind of uh, coordinated attempt to end democracy in the U.S. or or overthrow <laughs> the election or anything. Like, not that these you know, that essentially these people were wanderers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's some mob mentality that took over, but it's not like, it wasn't this grand organized plan yeah. to to do any of this stuff. It's interesting to note, I would just like to insert right here, that what, what they're being accused of do doing on January 6th mm -hmm. just happened in Sri Lanka. <laughs> yeah. Like, yesterday and today. <laughs> like, literally the people, like, stormed the Capitol buildings and... Took over the government and threw the president out. Yeah. <laughs> so, just say like that's that they in fact they just got back control of the buildings. I think today is what mm -hmm. I saw last night or today. I don't know if they're, what the time difference is. Interesting. Yeah. So I don't know. Just, I don't know anything about that actually. Yeah. So. Well, it's just something interest. Just an interesting little side note there that yeah. like this that that type of movement was successful there. Mm -hmm. So that one has slipped by me. I'm gonna have to look into that. Um, but, uh, Tom Woods said, um, that he had this like vision of being a, a, a young, um, historian or scholar some many decades in the future yeah. and deciding to focus his studies on, um, early 21st century American history. Yeah. And, um, and I can't remember exactly how he described it, but the the way it is in my head now, after having heard him say it, yeah. um, is like, okay, so you're you're this <laughs> reasonably intelligent person, um, maybe not overly so, but reasonably intelligent person who has been through, you know, the government school system and has heard, you know, talk about what happened and seen TV shows and movies and whatever, you know, just pop culture yeah. uh, stuff that referred back to the early 20th, 21st century, this earlier this century. And um, you've decided to, to focus on this in your studies. And as you start digging into the documentation and so forth, what you find is that everything that everybody believes about the early 21st century in America is a lie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could definitely see this. <laughs> and he's like talking about, um, you know, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Yeah. Uh, that the 2008 financial collapse, nobody could have foreseen and it had no real cause. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, uh, you know, 
um, COVID was this incredibly deadly pandemic that, you know, ran Just across the road. Ravaged the, yeah. the country. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> And that if it weren't for the, you the know, vaccine, the, the, yeah. yeah, the vaccine and the Mask, lockdowns yeah. and the masks that we would all have died yeah. um, in the humanity. As <laughs> yeah. We know it. yeah. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, that January 6th was a Pearl Harbor 9-11 level event where, um, you know, Everybody some radicals knows where in they America, were at that day. Yeah, yeah. And radicals in America attempted to overthrow the U S government. And so yeah. he's like, you know, so like you've got all these things, like these major events in, in, uh, you know, American history where the popular opinion or the popular belief about what happened is just a fabrication. Well, it, it, it does bring up an interesting thought to me that when you present it the way you just did, because mm-hmm. Generally, history is told by the people who win. So, and the media normally has a pretty large role in that. Um, but the media just doesn't have the same role today as far as telling the story and, and having the narrative as it used to. And I think that January 6th is going to be an interesting case study of just that, of just how. How does history remember the story? Because if you watch the mainstream media right now, like what you're portraying is is what you're getting is this is just a they that live in infamy. Yeah. But when you talk to people and and look at what's being said on at least the social media, I see and I know these are echo chambers, and I try to keep my echo chamber as little echoey as possible. Mm-hmm. But so I try to have a broad view, but. Like pretty universally, this is this January sixth is just dismissed as a joke, mm-hmm. and so it'll be interesting to see how history does remember that. Yeah, if if the if the narrative pushes through or if it doesn't. Well, there's certainly more alternative sources of information than there have been accessible yeah. alternative sources, yeah. and and the COVID thing will be the same way. Um, how will history really remember these events? You mm-hmm. know. Um, It'll be interesting to see in government schools. Yeah, well, that's that's the that's the trick. But I'll tell mm-hmm. you, government schools are changing too. Not at a rate I would like to see, but uh, more and more people are are either getting involved in their local school districts mm-hmm. or just pulling their kids in homeschooling. Yeah. Um. So I mean, we could we could potentially see a seismic shift there too. Yeah, and I would love it. Oh, but I, you know me, I'm all for it. Yeah. But, I mean, you can't bank on that. Though. Yeah. Like, I mean, the, the history would be against you on that. But, you know, anything's possible. <laughs> I, you know, I ran for a school board on a platform. If Well, if we can't eliminate public schools, let's make them as much like private schools as we can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which sometimes didn't go over as well. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I, like I found <laughs> I, I found the um, the main essay in Harper's to be be pretty interesting. And, um, he was, and I can't remember the author's name. I'm sorry. Uh, it was called American burlesque though. You can, you can look it up. Yeah. Um, and, uh, go to archive.is when you try to go to Harper's and they say that you have to, uh, um, whatever, subscribe, subscribe to, yeah. to see it. You just copy the link into archive.is. You can read it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, he, he kind of frames it as, um, this discussion of the last, um, like from the World War II essentially till now, uh, the, the this kind of has been a failure. Yeah. Um, and he's taught, he sets it up as the, as well, a I would definitely fight. Like describe it as a, as the decline. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. Oh, and the, like I said, the, um, the setup is that this, the, it's a statement. The American century is over. Yeah. Yeah. Right, it's not a question not a in question. the title. Yeah. It is yeah. a statement. Yeah, um, and he sets it up, or at least the future, um, <laughs> as uh, a um, a contest between two different ideas of what American foreign policy should be. Yeah, um, and he, he talks about the liberal internationalists, which um, we would kind of think of as the neocon or neoliberal position that we have been outspoken against yeah. all this time um uh, the phrase he uses is armed primacy the, essentially this idea that the u.s in order to um the the u.s must assert itself militarily throughout the globe and or in order to ensure peace um and uh security and prosperity for americans 
Police the world. Police the world. Yeah. Um, and uh, he he sets that up as against the versus the um, restrainers, uh, which believe in a in a more restrained foreign policy, um, interacting with the world in a peaceful way instead of a militaristic way, yeah. um, which is more where we would fall, you know. Yeah. Operating through through trade and uh, and agreements and so forth like that, Absolutely. and not being intent on exporting our way of life to every forcibly exporting yeah. our way of life to everybody yeah. else. Um, using our military as our 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 way would be using economics as as diplomacy, and the the flip to that, but would be not using, in the not in the aggressive way like we are with sanctions. Well, yeah, and things yeah, like that. no, yeah. I mean that's through, using economics through, as through diplomacy friendly too. trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, but I, I went back and I read the uh, um, the article that the phrase comes from, the American Century, yeah. uh, which was written by Henry Luce in 1941. I think it was like just a few months before Pearl Harbor. Yeah, um, where he was uh, he was making the case that. Um, <laughs> that the U S needed to step up, um, and be more assertive internationally. Um, and that, uh, that the reason the, like the rise of Hitler, and this is a time where we're like England and, and Germany were already at war. Um, we were supporting England, but we weren't actually like technically, like, we didn't declare war. We yeah. weren't like technically we involved, but we'd obviously, yeah, we'd obviously picked a side. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and we're trying to support them in a way so as to not actually enter the war, but yeah. And, and Luce makes the case that, um, that we were in the war. Yeah. Like we're already in the war. Yeah. Well, it's just um, like Ukraine right now. Like, yes. I mean, you can say what you will, but we're, we're in that war. Yeah. We may not be boots on the ground, but we've but we're involved. The, we've picked a side. Yeah. And we're supporting it. <laughs> yeah. Every way we can. Absolutely. And, um, he's saying that, uh, that the, the reason that the, I guess, is the U.S.'s unwillingness to assert itself throughout the world created the space for the rise of Hitler and Nazi Germany yeah. and Imperial Japan to try and expand. Yeah. Um, and so that what we needed to, to do, uh, and I'll quote him here, he says, to accept wholeheartedly our duty and our opportunity as the most powerful and vital nation in the world and in consequence to exert upon the world the full impact of our influence for such purposes as we see fit and by such means as we see fit. Yeah. Um, which is now he follows this up pretty quickly saying that he, you know, he's not advocating <laughs> that, that we become the police of the world. Um, but that but we, it sounds an awful lot like that. Mm. Yeah. I mean, but he's talking about just using our influence, like as asserting our influence to, um, for the good of the U S yeah, essentially throughout the world. Yeah. But he does have that line at the end um, for such purposes as we see fit and by such means as we see fit. Yeah. Um, and like he's certainly not uh, advocating the, you know, the liberal international order that is, you know, quoted so much there. He's talking about our way or the highway, essentially, like yeah. that we do what we need to do to um, to create a prosperous America. Yeah. And however we define that as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah. All right. um, now he explores like how we would define it and so forth. It's a 13 page article. I mean, it's so it's pretty detailed. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, what he's actually advocating there, um, like the shift, I guess, in the way of thinking about our role, um, the U.S.'s role, is that he's talking about um, the U.S. considering more than its territory that it needs to defend. The, yeah. the defense of the U.S. expands beyond the territory of the U.S. The defense of the U.S. means um, asserting ourselves however we need to around the world to secure what we call now American interests yeah. around the world. Yeah. The empire. Yeah. yeah. Um, it certainly set, set the U.S. on that path. I mean, this yeah. obviously was influential yeah. um, on some people. Now, of course, it didn't... It, it may not have directly influenced entrance into World War II because, like I said, Pearl Harbor happened a couple months later. Yeah, and, and we were know, going so. in after that yeah. one way. Or. Um, but, like, one of the things that, like, I, so I wrote down this quote out of it, um, which I thought was really interesting. Because he's, <laughs> he's talking about how, yeah, he's talking about how we've been deceived by our, uh, by our leaders. Yeah. Um, 
into being isolationist or whatever. Like now his position on what they're, what they want and what he wants is different. Is like the opposite of what yours and mine would be. Yeah. Although I wouldn't call us isolationists either, but, yeah. um, you know, in terms of venturism ar- around the world, yeah, uh, I mean, like on. he's, he's on the opposite side of Quincy Adams, uh, with the whole, we don't go around the world in search of monsters to destroy. Like he's, yeah. he's, he's after the monsters. Yeah. 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 Gotta, but got to squash them. He says, um, if our leaders have deceived us, it is mainly because we ourselves have insisted on being deceived. Their deceitfulness has resulted from our own moral and intellectual confusion. In this confusion, our educators and churchmen and scientists are deeply implicated. And he goes on in the next paragraph to say that journalists are implicated as well, but he's saying journalists are providing good information and people are misusing it, so... Yeah. You know, but he was, he maybe, was, a, that maybe once upon a time, that's true. Like, yeah. I mean, well, he was a media man. He's like essentially the, the, um, the rival to William Randolph Hearst yeah. at the time. This is a guy that owned time life publishing. Yeah. So. so he's a believer in media. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I, I do think that journalism was different then. Than it I do now. too. Like I actually, I, I do believe that. I don't think it was ever perfect, but I think that no. there used to be real journalists who went to get after real stories Yeah. Um, and didn't care where it led them. Whereas right. that's absolutely just not the case anymore. Yeah. I'm sure that there, there are still some of those too, but that's, but they're not, few and far between. Right. And they, they don't get the work and they don't get the reward for finding the story like they used to. Yeah. Um, like it used to be, if you found that story and dug it up, that you were, you, you've made a, a, a name for yourself mm-hmm. and, and that's not the case anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you're right. Um, but I, I thought it was particular, like this commentary is kind of interesting considering the last several years. And that, yeah. that was another thing actually, by the way, that, that Tom Woods and um, uh, Jason Rink had brought up is that like even, even for those of us who are skeptical of the government line, yeah. who, who already believe that governments lie, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> like the, the, the governments you, are just yeah. gonna lie to you. Yeah. Um, even for those that are, uh, those of us that are already skeptical, you almost have to be amazed at the brazenness of the lies over the last few years. Yeah. That they can be standing next to a screen showing a video that yeah. contradicts exactly what they're saying, and, and they it, keep saying with what, a straight face. Yeah. You repeat the lie over yeah. and over again. Um, and I'm just amazed how often it works. Yeah. Like, well, there's always going to be, uh, yeah, there's always going to be the people that just kind of get in line. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but, um, it, it has been surprising to me how few people are willing to say, you know, when somebody's standing there holding up five fingers and telling them it's three. Yeah. How many people are unwilling to say no? That I I can count. That's five. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So, uh, but he what Luce is saying is that like we're we're asking for it. Like this yeah. is what we want. It, yeah. It's kind of like my thing that I keep saying about um you know presidents acquiring more and more power. And I I said that I think that deep down people want a king. Yeah, yeah. They want, well, yeah, they want that one leader to look for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I think Luce is saying here that people are looking for that lie that comforts them, even if they know it's a lie. Yeah, yeah. They want a that lot lie of times, that comforts And there was, a, like I said, particularly during COVID, there was mm-hmm. a lot of that. People just wanted that, you know, safe information or whatever. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the thing that would make them feel safe. Exactly, Yeah. exactly. Um, and then you have Fauci and other... Who scientists are more than happy to give them yeah who are obliga- who that. you know are implicated in these lies that we listen to our yeah. educators yeah. who like he i don't know i just thought i thought that paragraph was really yeah. really interesting um and uh and something to just kind of bear <laughs> in mind um as we go through this now like he he even was talking about like actually bo- in both articles they were talking about american prestige and um, so Luce was saying, you know, that the U S had lost some prestige in recent years before, uh, world war two. Yeah. Um, and he was saying that the U S had lost some prestige by not being an international player. Yeah. Um, when they could have been. Yeah. And, uh, and of course the, the writer, the Harper's writer, um, was talking about the U S losing prestige for following the advice of Luce 
and ending up embroiled in these situations like um, Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya and all of these yeah. situations and our own financial well, crash. And Vietnam and, before that. Yeah. Like, I mean, all of these things, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. they, none of them helped. And and so he's he's saying that, like, now, if you're looking back at this and, he, and you're being honest with yourself. Yeah. That that the attempt to create the American century through a mil through military force. Yeah. Um, like who, what benefit has it really brought us? Yeah. Um, and as particularly when you look at it now and I talk about like, you know, um, at the beginning of this, yeah. you know, when loose is writing, yeah, you had one income earner generally in a family. Yeah. That supported the whole family. Yeah. Um, on a single job, <laughs> yeah, you know, even if it was blue collar work, yeah, um, still able to buy a house, yeah, take a vacation, uh, yeah. support kids, wife, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, buy a house, take some time, yeah, yeah. like and you actually get to raise your own kids, yeah, like, they're not raised by the the daycare up the street or yeah. something like that, or right. the government school, you mm -hmm. know, the gov I mean, they, were, they may go to the government yeah. school, but. It's, There's it's public a school far, there too, but <laughs> it's a far cry though from what we have now as far yeah. as raising the kids is concerned. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think that yeah. There's certainly been a change in what schools do. Like, um, in uh, dude, uh, in so, the mid 20th century, government schools were responsible for teaching your kids um, academic stuff. Yeah, and you as a parent were still responsible for the the moral. Um, lessons for your kids <laughs> yeah and i think that that's changed completely like that's changed and it i'm just constantly amazed that you know because i see this all the time is people just they look at the schools as their personal daycare yeah like that that is and that's all they view it as like they don't view it as anything more yeah it's just some place to keep my kids while i work all day yeah exactly mm -hmm. so um yeah, that's a that's certainly a shift that that I, I don't think has been positive for the the moral or frankly intellectual character of this nation, which no. is you know an, an, another thing that he mentions in that paragraph is that no. the moral and intellectual confusion yeah um, that we've created for ourselves yeah um, and uh, yeah so in Harper's they're asking the question like okay if we look back at what what the U.S. did to try and create the American century. Um, like it's just a swath of destruction. Yeah, yeah. And he, he, you know, he's using statistics from, um, like the uh the Brown University's cost of war, um, and so forth. You know, talking about how uh the U.S. has since 1990 or something like that has had a hundred and something foreign interventions, like that has yeah. involved itself in in. <coughs> in conflicts in foreign countries over a hundred times yeah. that the, the terror war has been ex an excuse for military operations in almost half the countries in the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and, and what have we gained from it? We've gone from, a, a, a society where the economy was such that, uh, a single income earner could support a whole family and buy a house and a car and, you yeah. know, and a TV. Yeah. And all the things that you might need and, you know, support children and so forth to um, two parents work, often three, maybe even four jobs total. Um, yeah. And still scraping by. Yeah. 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 So that's been the legacy because of and the cost of trying the, to maintain an empire. The decay of society. I mean, you mm -hmm. can't say that our society is is better and stronger now than it was then. Like I think there's, I think that's a hard argument to to make. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's just a, and, and the mass shootings to me that that falls right in there in line with it too. Yeah. With just the decay of society. Yeah. You know, hedonism. <laughs> yeah. Um, there. Uh, it, reading the Harper's article made me think um, on the American Century, uh, Luce's article. Um, and I thought, you know, what's what's kind of funny in this, it, and Luce did like look ahead at some of the things that may happen, yeah, and kind of dismiss them. But 
Yeah. Um, and, and there are things that have come to pass, like the collapse of our economy. And I mean, it's not a collapse yet, but yeah. um, oh, it's collapsed a few times. Well, <laughs> it's yeah, took some I guess stumbles. Could, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could, yeah, you could easily make that case. But yeah. um, it seemed to me inherent in the essay, but like unrecognized by the author. Yeah. Um, is the fact that the U.S. rose to prominence and power. Um, not through forcibly exporting its ideals, its politics, its goods, and um, and its culture, uh, but through widespread adoption and uh, and a recognition by other nations of the success that the U.S. was experiencing. Yeah. Right. And like even that's kind of a myth. You know, it's not like the U.S. Um, had been a little angel until w- the 20th century or something like that. Like, yeah. you know, we expanded westward. We took territory from um, yeah. from France and Spain and Mexico. And, like, you yeah, know, right. like, yeah. it is, it, you know, we, the U.S. certainly expanded in a military way, in an aggressive way, till it hit the Pacific. Yeah. Um, and, and continued to involve itself in other, um, in other nations, mostly in this hemisphere, though, like the Monroe Doctrine yeah. stuff. So, um, but it, it wasn't through uh, it wasn't through coercion that that the U.S. gained the power that it gained in the first place. Yeah, um, it was through being a, a an example. Yeah, uh, you know the, the the what is it? The, the shining, shining beacon. Yeah, yeah, light on the hill or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I. It's like he didn't recognize that, and embracing free economic free, yeah, yeah free freedom market, generally, free justice, market, liberty, yeah, yeah. you know. Well, and free market economics is what I was yeah. thinking, but like, I mean, that this country was built on that. Yeah, at least in the beginning. By the 1940s, that wasn't really. Well, yeah, by the 40s, that had kind of taken. I mean, it was it, it was obviously off. like far freer than it is yeah, now, but, but it had cooled off yeah. from its peak. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, it was in the early 20th century that the government really tried to assert its power over the economy. Yeah. Um, and started to. Good old Woodrow Wilson. Started to take some control. And yeah, yeah. you had the Federal Reserve by then. And like, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I, I think, I, I think it's like he totally, it's that, um, that paradox that we talk about all the time that like, we're going to make you a free nation yeah. at the point of the gun if we have to. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, that just doesn't even make any sense. And, and that seems to be what he's missing as well. What loose is missing as well. When he was advocating for America being coercive, um, to ensure it's, it's <laughs> own prosperity and security and the security of, you know, I yeah. mean like there's a part of it that is, you know, that he's concerned about, he, he's talking about, you know, like a Pax Americana. He's talking about the U S using its power to impose peace on the rest of the world. Yeah. That it might create this peaceful coexistence because there's this single world power that, yeah, that, that controls everything. Yeah. And, yeah. and in a benevolent way. Yeah. Um, but I mean that, that just on its face, like the government cannot be benevolent. Like yeah. it just, it's, it, doesn't happen yeah so and um the harper's article is talking about it in terms of china um a lot and uh but you know like the restrainer is saying well let's let's step back a little bit from china like there's some things that we want to prevent them from doing but we don't need to be as aggressive about it and he even makes the comment um using ukraine and the expansion of nato as an example about um you know behavior meant to deter war might very well incite it yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, I mean, we've already seen that. I mean, that's what's going on in Ukraine right now, by the way. That's yeah. a, that's actually a very well put phrase there. Yeah. Like, because that's exactly what we're experiencing. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's concerned about the same thing happening in China. And I don't, I, I have maintained over and over again, like cultural differences and so forth shouldn't be a concern of ours. Yeah. Like their political setup, that's their problem. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, what we have, like, why you would consider, why you consider Russia or China 
um, a, a rival, an enemy, an yeah. enemy. Okay, so like, okay, a, a rival, I can get that. Like, I, yeah. you know, that's okay. I got rivals yeah. that are friends. Yeah, um, exactly. But, well, and that can be a friendly competition. Right. But uh, enemy is a different thing, and yeah. especially when you treat them like an enemy, mm-hmm. um, which we've done with Russia, I mean, just on and on and on. And we do with China. We do too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, think of Trump's trade war. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, and and that's the thing that's most confusing about it. Like why we would we would speak of them as enemies or treat them like enemies. Um, Russia less so, but China, the, the Chinese economy and the American economy are totally entangled. Yeah, yeah. And and no we've more. got the better end of the deal because we're sending them this worthless paper and we're getting stuff. Exactly. Um, but uh, you know the it's like we're trying to put the the Bastiat. Aphorism, aphorism to the test about where goods cross borders. Armies, armies. armies actually, not, I think yeah. he says armies seldom do. Yeah. Um, but like, why would you? And he's even talking about um, in the Harper's article, you know, discussions of like, how do we fight China without cutting off trade? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. Like, like, yeah. Square that one and let me know. Well, yeah. Like, how um, does how does that work? So, if your economy is so interdependent, if you peace should always be the, the like, why would you even want to pick a fight? Yeah. Exactly. I don't, I, I don't understand it at all. <laughs> um, well, it's, because some people's economies are more important than others. That's well, really what it comes down to. I think what it comes down to more than that is is you've got a. Uh, military industrial complex Mm -hmm. that that wants that needs to sell these goods that's Uh, what i'm saying yeah their economies are more important than yours and mine yeah yeah okay yeah absolutely i mean because that's what it is like that's the reason because none of it makes logical sense yeah let's privatize these public funds send them to the the big um military contractors contractors, yeah. yeah yeah um and uh you know to hell with the average american who now um you know has a 20 percent increase in their monthly costs for regular goods and services yeah yeah which even if which we know that this is false but even if you believed everything coming out of the biden administration like that's what we're doing right now to russia like if mm-hmm. you believe what biden's saying russia is doing this to us yeah <laughs> like why would why would you vote for that guy again? No. <laughs> like, well, they're, they're trying to push him out. I don't think that'll be a concern. Really. I don't think it'll be a concern. I, I don't think Biden, I, I don't think the Democrat party will let Biden run in 2024. Wow. That's, that's probably a conversation for another podcast, but well, I've yeah, got it some, is. I don't want to get into that yeah, right now. I've got We're some already an hour in. That, yeah. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, um, hmm. I don't know all this. It's definitely, it's an interesting conversation to have. And I, I, I kind of, we, so we, the the country is definitely not heading in a positive direction, mm-hmm. um, and and in you can talk to anybody. That's that's just I, you don't talk to very many people who think we are, but but the course can still be changed. Yeah, and that's where I like to try to find the optimistic. Like we can mm-hmm. still fix these problems. Um, it's just, it, but we can't keep doing what we're doing and expect things to get better. Yeah, what we have to do is we have to accept that. American domination no longer exists. Yeah. And that probably the domination of any single country isn't really possible anymore. Yeah. I mean, barring some really severe war. Yeah. Um, and just be content with, uh, with our power and influence as it is like, yeah. you know, and try to avoid conflict. Yeah. And, and be content, you know, go back to the, was it Washington? Um, you know, idea of avoiding allies, of avoid entangling alliances and yeah. just trade, trade, <laughs> trade, trade with everybody yeah. and not try to use our military to force our way of life on the rest of the world because it, it creates resentment. Yeah. Um, well, not everybody wants to live like we do. We've got to elect leaders who are willing to do that, though. I mean, Biden's in Israel like today, like proclaiming how we're never going to let um, Iran get nuclear weapons. Like that was that was the big proclamation today. Well, or re- uh, re- reaffirming that proclamation. Yeah. Well, I've got good news for him then. Yeah, they're not even after him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Iran hasn't tried to yeah. create nuclear weapons. Yeah, um, and that they have a, a religious um, prohibition against 
them. Yeah. So, and it is a theocracy. Yeah. But it, <laughs> it's, yeah, like I say, we're never going to, we're never going to get where we need to go with leaders like that, yeah. that, that are, that are playing these type games. Yeah. Um, and I, like I say, I don't, that, that's the only salute, the best solution I can get. And I mean, people got to start thinking different and voting different. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the trick. Yeah. And remember that foreign policy matters to you. Yeah. Like, yeah. um, I had a discussion with somebody recently and it was like, you know, well, this just doesn't really affect my life. Affects it more than like, you think. Yeah, absolutely. It does. Yeah. And you've got kids like yeah. this absolutely affects their lives too, because the collapse of the U S currency of the U S dollar. No. Yeah. You can put it squarely on the back of the, the military adventurism of the last oh, absolutely. 75 years. Yeah. Uh, and particularly since the terror war began. Yeah. Um, well, and, and these even, things are all interconnected. The militarization of the police, the surveillance state, like all of these things are connected to our, um, adventurism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. our, our attempt to assert ourselves militarily throughout the world. Um, the armed primacy yeah. idea. <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. So, um, and you want, you want a freer, more prosperous, uh, just better lives for yourself and your family and your, you know, your progeny. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is like the most important thing that we can do is like end this, this idea that we need to militarily assert ourselves all over the world. Yeah. This yeah. is the most expensive in, in um, both an economic and a moral way. Yeah. Uh, the most expensive thing that the United States is doing. Absolutely. And so, um, does that seem like a good place to end? I think it may be. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, <laughs> we, um, we didn't miss a week. Yeah, that, <laughs> nice. We're, we're here. Um, and we plan to do it again next week. Yep. Um, in the meantime, um, you can follow us on Facebook. Uh, you can subscribe on iTunes, you iTunes, YouTube, and or Podbean. Um, like, and share, uh, the podcasts, the memes, the whatever. Yeah. Um, tell your friends. Absolutely. And uh, and there one eight three three stop war. That's still in oh, place. Yeah. So if you haven't made that call, make that call. Yeah. Um. I guess that's it. So uh, we plan to be back next week uh, when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm -hmm.